Support for this and all the free content of Addressing Gettysburg is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. This is Cody Aish coming to you for what is my now second individual interview or, or program uh, here for Addressing Gettysburg podcast. Um, really want to thank Matt and Eric for setting this up once again for me to be able to present another project to you that, uh, that speaks to memory of individuals involved in the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War in general, but, but Gettysburg in particular. Uh, the last time I was here a few months ago, for those who have listened to that episode, you might recall I talked about the memory of uh, Robert E. Lee by Frederick Douglass. And though that wasn't Gettysburg specific, that was a, a talk I was supposed to have given over the winter for Gettysburg National Military Park Winter Lecture Series, which for a couple of reasons was uh, was postponed and then unfortunately uh, canceled after weather and then the, the current pandemic. Um, but this event is going to focus a little bit more specifically on, on Gettysburg, though the two themes are a bit tied together in ways that we will see as we go uh, throughout the next hour or so. Um, generally speaking, what we're going to be talking about today is the reunion of 1869, which in the grand scheme of the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War is forgotten, um, partly for good reason. Uh, it wasn't the most successful reunion uh, in Gettysburg history, uh, but it's important nevertheless because it's the first attempt at a blue-gray reunion in Gettysburg history. And for those who are unaware, as its name I perhaps uh, perhaps strongly suggest a blue-gray reunion would be a reunion involving not just United States veterans, Union veterans, and not just Confederate veterans, but men coming together, the blue and the gray, on the same battlefield at the same time. And at this point in American history, 1869, consider the fact that we are just four years removed from the end of the, the shooting portion of the conflict. Of course, Reconstruction has begun as an in, and is in full effect by this point. Uh, and we're only six years removed from the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. So those war wounds, both the literal ones and, and the figurative ones, the rhetorical ones, the political ones, uh, the moral ones from a certain perspective, all are, are very open, very much, uh, very deep at this point in time. And so for this reunion to have gone off the the way that it did um, is quite a risk for those who are involved in that process. And we'll talk more about those who planned this reunion here momentarily. But I just want to set us up with a bit about Blue Gray reunions in Gettysburg history, because they are something that I think we all want to assume happen more often, more frequently, with more success than they actually did. And that's because some of the most striking images that we can imagine or see in Gettysburg history are, of course, those uh, famous photographs taken in 1913 and in 1938 at, respectively, the 50th and 75th anniversaries of the battle. Uh, the 1913 reunion, 50th anniversary, oftentimes called the Great Peace Jubilee. The 1938, 75th anniversary, oftentimes called the Last Reunion of the Blue and the Gray. And at each of these reunions, there's national attention paid uh, in 1913, in particular, there are some 55,000 Civil War veterans who come to Gettysburg. It's a massive success, both in, in uh, literal fig, you know, figures, uh, getting that many people to come to the battlefield, uh, certainly a success. Uh, it's an economic gain for the town. Hotels are filled, although there is a bit of violence that does break out. Uh, in the town itself, uh, there's a stabbing at the Gettysburg Hotel after a Confederate veteran said something derogatory about Lincoln. So it's not all reconciliation. Um, in 1938, it's a smaller audience because so many veterans have died out by that time. But nevertheless, tens of thousands of people are bottlenecking the streets of Gettysburg in each of those instances. And then there's also the Blue Gray Reunion, which is a little less famous, but nevertheless, uh, it is it is probably the first really successful one. Uh, which would have occurred in uh, in 1887, which uh, which is the 20, uh, 24th anniversary of the battle. And this will involve men of George Pickett's old Confederate division, as well as veterans of the Philadelphia Brigade Association. And they will as well have these pictures of them taken near the angle. Uh, this is the dedication of the Armistead wounding marker uh, for Lewis Armistead, of course, mortally wounded during Pickett's charge. And 
these few examples of blue-gray reunions would lead us to believe that men are always willing to shake hands, as the saying goes, across the bloody chasm. And there's a wonderful book on this by M. Keith Harris called Across the Bloody Chasm. Uh, the subtitle is The Culture of Commemoration Among Civil War Veterans. And he really goes into the fact that when men were amongst their own comrades in reunions and monument dedication uh, ceremonies among their own veterans, uh, they said very different things and, and, and meant very different things than when they were with men of the other side, their former adversaries. And at Gettysburg, this is certainly the case. If you read monument dedication speeches at individual uh, monument or, or regimental associations, they, they read very differently than do the events of 1887 or 1913 or 1938. There's a different feel to them. Reconciliation is the name of the game, if you will whenever these men are together in these blue-gray settings. But there are, are a lot of sectional prides whenever men are, are with themselves. They're more inclined as United States veterans to talk about issues like emancipation and slavery and disunion and treason uh, than, are, than they are whenever they are with their former Confederate adversaries. So in 1869, we have, of course, a reunion that takes place much, much earlier than any of those. As we said, four years after the war, six years after the battle, uh, the timing of this is rather fascinating. And it doesn't go off as a very large success, as we will, we will discuss. Only three Confederate veterans appear to have actually shown up. Two we can definitely uh, have record of, another who appears on the role of, of one newspaper account, and we'll talk about who each of these men were, why they were there, and what they took away from this reunion. Just to set the stage uh, of why this reunion comes about and how it comes about, we have to go to the days right after the Battle of Gettysburg in July 1863. Of course, it's fought the first three days of that month, and within a few weeks, we start to see that David McConaughey, a local Gettysburg attorney, he had served as the uh, president or overseer of the, the Gettysburg Evergreen Cemetery, which uh, predates the battle to the 1850s. It was the namesake for Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. He's a political rival of sorts uh, for David Wills, another Gettysburg attorney who one of the most famous figures in the town's history, certainly, as the agent of Andrew Curtin, Pennsylvania's governor during the Civil War. And he'll procure the land on the western side of Cemetery Hill, which becomes Soldiers National Cemetery. But as David Wills is doing that work for the burial of these United States dead on the battlefield, some 3,500 soldiers killed fighting for the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg, David McConaughey, simultaneously is working to preserve the battlefield itself. And he will start an organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, which is going to be sponsored uh, eventually by the Pennsylvania State Legislature. It will provide some funding and some resources for McConaughey uh, to kind of put the ball in motion and raise money and have signatories from the town and throughout the armies and across the country, uh, basically suggesting the importance of preserving pieces of the Gettysburg battlefield. And while these two men are working, McConaughey for the Battlefield Memorial Association, David Wills for the burial of the U.S. dead at Soldiers National Cemetery, there's a third figure, a non-local figure, John Batchelder, who is from New Hampshire, a landscape painter, who is going to interview eventually at least one veteran from every unit, North and South, United States and Confederacy, which fought at the Battle of Gettysburg. And these are, as I like to say, sort of the three major pioneers, if you will, in Gettysburg memory. And that gets us kind of rolling during the Civil War itself, between 1863, after the battle, and the end of the war in 1865. This is how we're going to set the stage for how Gettysburg is remembered on a national scale, as well as when people visited Gettysburg. These three individuals really put into, uh, into motion kind of the framework for how we visit Gettysburg even to this day, really. Another thing that's happening at this time is the early stages of monumentation, and this has a major uh, impact on the eventual reunion of 1869. And when we look at a series of firsts here, I have six firsts for you, if you will, as far as monuments go, we can kind of trace a little bit of a timeline, and this goes from the year after the battle up to 25 years after the battle. We have the first sort of rock carvings, these crude memorials or monuments 
Think of items like strong Vincent's uh, mortal wounding marker, which is carved into a rock on Little Round Top. That's somewhere around 1864, 1865, and predates formal monuments on the battlefield. The first monument that's actually started is the cornerstone of Soldiers National Monument. This takes place in 1865 with an address by the man who commanded the 11th Corps during the battle, Oliver Otis Howard, and who was the chairman of the Freedmen's Bureau in the aftermath of, of the war when he comes back to Gettysburg to dedicate the cornerstone of that memorial. The full thing won't be completed, though, until 1869, the same summer, as we, we know of the Blue-Gray reunion that we're speaking about. The first monument that's really completed takes place in 1867, and that will be for the first Minnesota uh, which was, in the grand scheme of the Civil War, the first volunteer regiment of United States soldiers to have enlisted at the start of the Civil War in 1861, and of course is very well known for its costly, heroic act on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863 at Gettysburg. But they will get a monument of their own in Soldiers National Cemetery in 1867 in the form of a memorial urn. And it was somewhat controversial because the Battlefield Memorial Association felt that n- probably no other units or states would follow suit by erecting monuments of their own. And they raised the question, would it not look strange if one state, if one regiment had a memorial and no others did? They think that the Soldiers National Monument, then still being worked on for two more years, would be enough in the form of monumentation on the battlefield. And of course, as we know today, that is uh, sort of laughable because today there are 1,300 monuments, markers, memorials, statues, plaques, waysides across this battlefield, making Gettysburg what appears to be the largest sculpture garden in the world is how it is often phrased. The first monument to an individual outside of Soldiers National Cemetery, this takes us beyond to the timeline we're focusing about today, but it is worth noting, uh, is the Strong Vincent marker uh, in 1878. This is a different marker than the one that was initially uh, etched into the rock on Little Round Top. We talked about this a little bit if you're a Patreon pa- patron of uh, of addressing Gettysburg. We, we talked a bit about why that is in, in the interview uh, the other day, a couple different locations to interpret there. The first monument to a regiment outside Soldiers National Cemetery is to the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry. That's dedicated in 1879 in Spangler's Meadow near Spangler's Spring and Culp's Hill. And then the first statue on the battlefield will be to Governor Warren in 1888 on Little Round Top, maybe the most famous individual statue on the battlefield with perhaps the rare exception of, uh, of Robert E. Lee on the Virginia Memorial. But that gives you a sense of kind of the timeline of firsts. And the, the era of, of monumentation really, by and large, is the 1880s, 1890s. So even after this period that we've just given a a brief timeline of is when the vast majority of states will dedicate their monuments and memorials. Um, Gettysburg in the first few years after the Civil War, also important for understanding a Blue Gray reunion taking place in 1869, is that this park is treated primarily as a United States Veterans Memorial Park for several decades, really. It was a location at which former Confederates and white Southerners really had little interest in visiting. Uh, Black Southerners, formerly enslaved, African Americans in general, will frequently visit Gettysburg for decades to come, uh, especially each year on September 22nd, which was called Emancipation Day. That was the day, uh, day in 1862 after the Battle of Antietam that Abraham Lincoln had issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And African Americans across the United States, uh, held that as as kind of a sacred date for quite some time and used it as a means by which to actively visit Gettysburg each year. And and that is something that would change over time as well, especially as reconciliation settled in and black Americans did not feel quite as welcome to come to this site where white men fought white men and shook hands over the bloody chasm and sort of forgot about the contributions of African Americans and the fundamental results of the Civil War uh, and emancipation as a whole. But uh, the the lack of Confederate visitation, former Confederates coming to Gettysburg in the years after, is partly due to a lack of money. It's partly as well due to uh, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association rules. So not only do Confederate veterans have little interest in coming to the site of perhaps their greatest defeat. Not only are they not interested in putting up monuments or traveling there because they're low on funds in the Reconstruction era South, uh, but the Battlefield Memorial Association 
has these rules which really will limit the possibility of Confederate veterans erecting monuments on their on the field, um, partly because of things like the line of battle rule, which said that you had to put your memorial on the field in a proper line of battle where you fought. And it had to be the position where you, you started your advance if you began one. Well, think about where Confederates started their advance on the second and third days of battle. By and large, two-thirds of the army was down what is today West Confederate Avenue along Seminary Ridge. Another third of the army would have been roughly in the town of Gettysburg, especially along Middle Street. None of those locations are are in the confines of the park at that time. Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association did not have access to those locations. And so a rule such as the line of battle rule would disallow a Confederate uh, unit, even if it was interested in erecting a memorial uh, in those confines. There are going to be some uh, exceptions to this as the years go on. There's the Armistead Memorial we have already mentioned. As I said, 1887, that's placed within the angle where Lewis Armistead was mortally wounded. And then uh, it was a year before that, in 1886, that we see the first actual uh, state-sponsored unit, uh, regimental association-sponsored Confederate monument, and that's to the 1st Maryland Battalion, later known as the 2nd Maryland Infantry, which erected one of its own on Culp's Hill in 1886. It becomes controversial a few years later, and there are calls to have it torn down in 1889, uh, largely by U.S. veterans of the Civil War. Grand Army of the Republic posts, especially in Pennsylvania, are offended. They actually have a headline on one of their uh, protests, one of their, uh, their resolutions that literally says, Rebel Monuments Offensive. And so this kind of hints at the origins of a lot of the debates that we are still, of course, having to this day, which are nothing new. Nobody today is starting these conversations for the first time. We are merely continuing those debates and discussions uh, that were unfinished by participants of the Civil War itself, of men of that generation. And that goes back as well to something that I pointed out the last time I was on here with regard to Frederick Douglass and Robert E. Lee. You could take many of those arguments that men are making about a Lee statue and their opposition to it and apply them to today. It sounds like we're sort of reading off of the same script. And then the final thing I want to mention about uh, these years is that specifically in 1869, the year that this reunion takes place, we have a couple of extremely significant events in Gettysburg history. And there are four that I would like to highlight, uh, including the reunion, plus three others that take place that year. And I would say that when you put all this together, 1869 is perhaps outside of the battle and outside of like the 25th anniversary of the battle. In that first quarter century after the Battle of Gettysburg, 1869 is a fundamental year. It is a year in which there's a lot happening, in which a lot of momentum begins for how eventually Americans and local Gettysburgians and veterans of this war would all begin to see Gettysburg in this national collective memory. Uh, The first major event that happens that year is on January 25th, when Frederick Douglass visits and speaks at Gettysburg. And this highlights a lot of racial tensions in the town. His speech, which is called William the Silent, uh, was about the 80 years war from 1568 to 1648. But he basically takes that conflict and kind of adapts it Uh, to his own understanding as a means of of coming to grips with the American Civil War and putting the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln and the Battle of Gettysburg and all these events from 1861 to 1865 on a national scale, uh, an international scale, I should say. In in world history, he puts puts what happened at Gettysburg and, and elsewhere across the American landscape in the 1860s. And when he leaves, the press reactions to his presence in Gettysburg uh, we'll, we'll open these racial chasms. We can start to see that the conservative Democratic press opposes his, his mere being at Gettysburg. They panned the speech. They hated it. On the other side, we have Republicans, at that time the liberal or progressive party uh, on the political spectrum. Um, they are highlighting the, the, the prominence of Douglas, that he is a black man. They are proud. They are proud that the Gettysburg audience was relatively diverse. There were a lot of African Americans in the audience. And so what this really shows us is that the year of this Blue Gray reunion in Gettysburg opens with 
a controversial figure of his time, Frederick Douglass, visiting town and eliciting, eliciting uh, certainly controversial reactions from across the spectrum. On June 28th, fast forwarding a couple of months, uh, 1869, the Springs Hotel will open. We'll talk more about that hotel and its location, but suffice to say, it becomes a significant piece of Gettysburg's tourism history for the next several decades into the 20th century. And this was eventually where the men at the 1869 Veterans Reunion lodged uh, in August when they come to town. On July 1st, 1869, a couple days after the hotel opened, is the dedication of Soldiers National Monument. And George Meade will be there, former commander of the Army of the Potomac, at the Battle of Gettysburg, of course, in 1863. And his speech really sort of opens the door to a possible reconciliation uh, movement in Gettysburg, or at the very least, this sort of uh, uh, of Confederate interpretation. It opens the door to the possibility that uh, Confederates seemed to have had some role in this story, which, of course, they, they uh, were one of the armies that fought there. And so uh, Meade makes the case that they should be respected in that regard. I'll read a, a brief excerpt of his speech, which does set this scene for this Blue Gray reunion just really a few weeks after he spoke these words. He said after kind of speaking for several minutes, there is one subject, my friends, which I will mention now and on this spot while my attention is being called to it. When I contemplate this field, I see here and there the marks of, of hastily dug trenches in which repose the dead against whom we fought. Why should we not collect them in some suitable place? I do not ask that a monument be erected over them. I do not ask that we should in any way endorse their cause or their conduct or entertain other than feelings of condemnation for their course, but they are dead. They have gone before their maker to be judged. And over the next four years uh, until 1873, we will start to see about 3,300 Confederate remains uh, taken from the Gettysburg battlefield into southern cities, especially Hollywood Cemetery at Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. George Meade, though, is very careful with his words, because as we saw, he makes very clear that he does not want a Confederate monument on the Gettysburg battlefield. He just wants the dead to be buried in a consolidated piece of ground, much like the United States dead had been in Soldiers National Cemetery. So keep that in mind as kind of a, a key moment, a key event, um, that Confederate Veterans, Confederate dead are now for the first time, really, in the aftermath of the Civil War, entering the Gettysburg story with how should we pay homage to them. And then, of course, we have this first ever Blue Gray reunion, which takes place from August 23rd to 27th, 1869. So that really sort of all sets the stage for the context of this period. I might have gone on a little too long with that, but I think it is really important to understand what are these people thinking who are in charge of this reunion? What are locals thinking? What are veterans re, uh, thinking who may be soon returning to the Gettysburg battlefield? All imperative for our understanding uh, of kind of contextualizing this moment. Now, a lot of what we know about this reunion is uh, is in the David McConaughey papers, which are at uh, Gettysburg College uh, in Musselman Library. And Four years ago now, three or four years ago, 2016 or 2017, um, I went through the McConaughey papers and pulled out everything really I could find as pertains to this reunion. And I just want to go through a bit of, of the planning of it to give us a sense of, uh, of what exactly were they trying to do with having a blue-gray reunion so soon after the event. We'll talk as well about some of the ulterior motives that maybe McConaughey didn't state but that others felt around him. Uh one of the first pieces of correspondence is just a few weeks before the reunion on July 20th, 1869, David McConaughey, again, Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association founder and president. He writes a letter to John White Geary, who was a major general and a former division commander in the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac before that corps was sent west to uh, serve in Sherman's armies in, in the last year and change of the war. But Geary, by this point in time, is the governor of Pennsylvania, of course, a lot of political weight within the Commonwealth. And so McConaughey basically explains to Geary what he is hoping uh, to accomplish on the Gettysburg battlefield with this Blue Gray reunion. And here's a little bit of what he said to Geary. He said, The Battlefield Memorial Association has unanimously adopted resolutions, determining to proceed to indicate the field with enduring memorials constructed of the granite from these hills, 
and thus to permanently mark out positions and movements of the armies, corps, divisions, and important commands in the battle. So to this point, what is he saying? We want to put up markers on this field, not necessarily monuments that we think of today, not necessarily dedicated by individual units, as we've talked about, this is not a popular idea for about another decade, but they want to put up these objective markers on the field to indicate, as he says, the Army's core divisions and other important commands of the battle. So the bigger picture, not quite down to the brigade, regimental, uh, or company markers, like flank markers we see today, uh, but just to indicate in, in kind of broad sweeping motions what men did on this battlefield and where they did it. He explained to Gary, did McConaughey, that the Battlefield Memorial Association's, quote, object is to perpetuate the history of the battle in its simple truth, and to that end, to make the battlefield its own interpreter. It seeks to preserve this field as an enduring historical memorial of military events, as a school for study in practically illustrating the art of war, and as an ever-eloquent, though silent, exponent alike to citizen and foreign visitor of the Battle of Gettysburg. The association desires to derive the important requisite information from authentic and original sources. It earnestly realizes that justice to themselves and fidelity to the truth of history entitles the officers who commanded the forces to action to designate the positions and define the movements thus to be perpetuated. Now, of course, there's a it's kind of a wordy explanation, but what he is saying here is, the best way to preserve this battlefield uh, is to talk to the people who fought here and understand what portions of it were most important, authentic and original sources, in his words. And the best way to do that, he says, is to talk to the officers who fought here. So now he's working toward what he's really wanting to ask of Geary. And in the end of the letter, he invites him to, quote, cooperate in this work of indication and to attend a reunion of the officers of your brigade, division, corps, and army upon the battlegrounds to confer together and determine the positions and important points proper to be thus enduringly designated. So here we have McConaughey saying the best way that we can all figure out what happened here and how we can best mark it is if we all simply get together on the field. Now, he's going to start inviting only officers. This is not a general Blue Gray reunion like we'll see in 1913 or 1938. This is for specific, really, invitation only. At least that's the plan. That goes a, a little bit awry as well, as we will see. Uh, but that is going to be his plan. And he schedules this for August 23rd, 1869 at the Springs Hotel. That's a little problematic because McConaughey was the owner of the Springs Hotel, so some people think that this is just an economic grab on his point. Um, he says that at the hotel, quote, the accommodations are ample and excellent, and free travel will be provided to the visiting officers via the railroads le leading to them. The Battlefield Memorial Association will... Uh, indicate with its own resolutions uh, on kind of a broader sense, not just the invitations, but it will talk about specifically what they want to do. Uh, they will talk about the, quote, physical aspect of the field. Uh, they will want to, quote, indicate the field with plain but enduring memorials constructed from the granite of these hills, similar language to what McConaughey had, uh, had written to Geary. They want to indicate the more prominent events of the three-day struggles, which will afford all visitors a ready acquaintance with this battle, which perhaps better than any other illustrates the greatest wager of battle of the century. And then they said that this association deems the generals who commanded the armies, corps, division, and brigades in the battle should be invited to furnish the information required in order truly to designate the positions and events to be perpetuated. And that now, before death or absence prevents it, the association instructs its secretary to invite the generals and officers of the several corps to visit the field in the first week of August. As we said, it gets a, a bit delayed to August 23rd. And, uh, and that the secretary, quote, will uh, cooperate in making such arrangements for the reunion at Gettysburg as will promote this object. So now the pieces are put in play. Talk to men of both sides. Get them to this battlefield and understand from their perspectives what exactly happened here by way of traveling around the field with these officers and, and getting a grasp on where individual actions took place and where we should mark them. Now, this is revolutionary, and, and it is a sure change from everything the battlefield 
Memorial Association has indicated up to this point. Uh, one of the popular things that they like to say in the aftermath of the Civil War was made it very clear, as I said a, a while ago, that this was a, a United States Veterans Memorial Park, um, that this was basically a place at which Union veterans could come and understand uh, what they had done for the betterment of the of the country. And what we start to see is that in many instances, um, in the aftermath of the war, it had been very clear that words such as uh, the, the betterment of the republic, that the saving of the republic, things along those lines are what the Battlefield Memorial Association hoped to make clear was the significance of Gettysburg. Nothing about the fact that members of, of both uh, the United States and Confederate armies had fought there, nothing about it being a common ground or a hallowed ground, nothing about being a place where men could shake hands across the, the bloody chasm, going back to that line. Um, and so this is really kind of the first time at which we can see that uh, that they are looking uh, uh, to, to both sides for an understanding of, of what had happened at Gettysburg. So what we'll start to see is that at least uh, 96 veterans receive invitations, um, as I said, including men from from both armies. Um, many more than that will eventually uh, receive invitations, it seems, because men who received invitations will, will then invite others around them. And we can see this happen on many occasions where an officer would say, uh, I received your invitation, Mr. McConaughey, and took it upon myself to... Uh, invite these five men around me who I, I know live in my town and, and would probably be interested in coming as well. Uh, he doesn't get a ton of favorable responses. Of the 96 that he sends out, uh, 59 confirm that they'll be there. Uh, so, you know, around 60%. I guess that's not too bad. Uh, 37 will outright decline. And then eventually when the reunion takes place, 65 are listed on the initial count by the New York Tribune as having arrived on the battlefield. Uh, I recently found another account, though, um, from the Harrisburg Telegraph, a uh, more local newspaper to Gettysburg, of course, Harrisburg, just 40 miles or so north of town, from September 21st, so about a month afterward. And uh, they listed a total of 134 men who were present. So in the grand scheme of things, a very small reunion uh, with numbers ranging from you know a few dozen to upward of, of 134, uh, it appears, were, were actually there on, on the battlefield. Uh, this will include 30 men from the Army of the Potomac 1st Corps, 12 from the 2nd Corps, 16 men from the 3rd Corps, 17 from the 5th Corps, 9 from the 6th Corps, 9 from the 11th Corps, 23 from the 12th Corps, 5 from the Cavalry, uh, not, uh, 6 artillerymen, two signal corpsmen, and five surgeons. If you're wondering how many Confederates showed up, it appears precisely three. So 134 United States veterans will be on this battlefield, two confirmed Confederates with the possibility of a third. Now let's look at just briefly some of the, uh, the correspondence, some of the invitations that were sent and the responses to them. In sweeping terms, what we see in most of these is either... I'm going to be there because I think this is a worthy object and I can't wait to be there. Um, on the negative side, on the, the side of the men who say that they can't be there, usually there is this kind of notion of, ah, I really wish I could, but my schedule doesn't allow me to be. In some instances, though, in the most famous instances, uh, we see that someone like Robert E. Lee declines to be there because he doesn't think it's worth it. This is now a famous line written August 5th, 1869, in which Lee responds to McConaughey by saying the following. My engagements will not permit me to be present, and I believe if there, I could not add anything material to the information existing on the subject. I think it wiser, moreover, not to keep open the sores of war, but to follow the examples of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife and to commit to oblivion the feelings it engendered. In many ways, Lee's son, William H. F. H. F. Lee, uh, is even more direct in his denial uh, of the reason he does not want to be there. He called it a hospitable invitation, but he says, I rather think, and write in all kindness, sir, that if the nation is to continue as a whole, it is better to forget and forgive, rather than perpetuate in granite, proofs to its civil wars. Sincerely thanking you and your association for the conciliatory spirit, which prompted a courteous invitation. So what did we talk about was the 
fundamental reason that McConaughey wants this reunion to take place. It's to dedicate, or at least plan, where there will be dedicated markers on the field, monuments on the field. And here, William H. F. Lee, son of the great general and, and commanding officer of the Army of Northern Virginia for the Confederacy, says that he does not think it is wise to, quote, perpetuate in granite proofs to civil wars. This is a line, Lee's and his son's, which you will see often on social media, in news media, in response to the proposition to take down Confederate monuments across the country, in particular, statues of Lee. And a lot of people use this as evidence that Lee does not seem to have been in favor of there being uh, monuments to him or other Confederates. I'm not going to get into that debate here, but it is worthy of our examination that uh, these are the men to whom these memorials were intended to be dedicated, and, and they did not seem to favor them in their own right. Now, there's a multitude of reasons for that uh, taken into consideration as well. Lee's complicated relationship with the federal government, with the fact that uh, Robert E. Lee was, uh, w- was indicted for treason and never came to full fruition. Go check out John Reeves's book, The Lost Indictment of Robert E. Lee, for more on that subject. Uh, Lee is involved in many questionable racial confrontations and and, uh, movements during the Reconstruction era. He calls Reconstruction politics a, quote, evil upon the the people of the South. So behind the scenes, Robert E. Lee is is somewhat of a different figure than he is publicly. Publicly, he he knows, for instance, that his letter to David McConaughey is probably going to be published in the press, and it is all over the country. It's big news that Lee doesn't want to be at Gettysburg. It's even bigger news, the reason that he gives. But privately, uh, Lee is a bit less reconciled than I think we uh, typically give him credit for. Um, And a lot of that as well, hearkening back to that Douglas and Lee episode uh, that I was last on a few months ago. I talked a bit more about that general in-depth treatment of Lee there, that Lee is a figure we have to read very closely. Nevertheless, this is is a fascinating piece of of the puzzle that he won't return to Gettysburg in 1869, or for that matter, uh, ever. Now contrast that just briefly with someone like James Longstreet. Um, Longstreet is going to be really in support of, uh, of this memorialization effort um, and this uh, reunion. I apologize. Let me pull up his account. Uh, he wrote to McConaughey they couldn't be there, but he, but he wished that he could be. Highly appreciating the object and motives of your association, he said, my interest in it is enhanced as one of the chief actors on the field. I am not a little disappointed then to find myself constrained to forego the pleasure of meeting the wishes of yourself and the gentlemen whom you represent. At present, important affairs require my presence in New Orleans, and the indications are that I shall not be able to leave it this season. So here you have James Longstreet, um, ever the contrary to, to Robert E. Lee, really thinks it's a good idea that this reunion is taking place, but but simply can't. Be there, and that was the case. To be fair, for for many Confederate veterans, that is something that we do really commonly see in many of their reactions and their uh, responses. But some men did feel that the reunion had some ulterior economic and political motives. We talked about the Springs Hotel, how David McConaughey was the the proprietor of that institution, and um, and the fact that uh, that that you know this might be an effort for him to gain some some economic uh, gain that if he could get veterans of the battle to come to his hotel that would be a really good way to publicize that the men who fought at Gettysburg love to stay in my hotel so you should too uh, or when these veterans now begin to return in greater numbers for the decades to come maybe they'll be more inclined to bring their families and this would be a great economic gain. The Springs Hotel, it is worth noting as as well, is no longer there. Uh, it will be open for a few decades until the early portion of the 20th century. I highly recommend the book Beyond the Run by director uh, of the Adams County Historical Society, Andrew Dalton, which talks about the Emanuel Harmon Farm before, during, and after the Battle of Gettysburg, and then the Medicinal Springs, which become worldwide famous in Gettysburg. And that is the site of the Springs Hotel, which if you travel out of Gettysburg westbound today on Route 30, would have been on the southern side of the road just behind Herbst Woods, the famous site of the the first Corps fighting uh, on on the first day of the battle in 1863. There are remnants of... uh, of the Springs Hotel Road today. Springs Avenue, for instance, is still in Gettysburg. It cuts right through the Lutheran Seminary, just to the north of Middle Street. 
It eventually ends on the campus of the seminary, but you can kind of get a sense if you look at it where it would have stretched across the road. And then today's Meredith Avenue, a National Park Service road, was uh, basically where that road connected to. There's a monument there, a famous monument for the 142nd Pennsylvania. And if you look at that monument today, it famously uh, looks like a uh, a cross is how many people interpret it. It's how I interpreted it for a long time, um, and with good reason. It looks like a Christian cross. It looks like a crucifix. Uh, some people interpret it as a grave marker. How the Gettysburg Compiler described it, though, one of the town's newspapers, when the monument was completed and dedicated in 1889 at Pennsylvania Day, uh, was as a, quote, crossroads handboard. And basically, what that indicates is a 19th century road sign. And one of the interpretations for why they would have made that monument look like a road sign was because it sat at what was then the intersection of Reynolds Avenue, still there today as a Park Service road, and Springs Avenue, which is no longer there today. uh, Or I'm sorry, Springs Road, which is no longer there today, but a remnant, as we said, still exists with Springs uh, Avenue. For more on that monument, go check out the Battles and Banter podcast feed. Uh, and there's a lecture that I gave last August in Gettysburg on Pennsylvania Day, the day that that memorial was dedicated, and a bit more about how soldiers interpreted that and veterans interpreted that. And, of course, that interpretation of it being a cross extends to today. It is an interpretation that many veterans had, but at its inception, what it really was was this sort of 19th century uh, road sign and the Springs Hotel and the road that led to it is, to me, it seems the primary reason why they used that symbolism. So the Springs Hotel is going to be the site of this uh, reunion. There are these ulterior economic gains that some people read into it. They also read into it some political gains, potentially. Um, Alexander Webb, the former commander of the Philadelphia Brigade, he initially felt the reunion, quote, had not been properly arranged and felt Uh, It was being held in favor of, quote, the interests of those interested in the Springs and also toward the personal interest of Colonel Batchelder. We talked about John Batchelder earlier, this first kind of historian of the battle. But eventually, Alexander Webb and others admit that he was, quote, satisfied that my suspicions were unfounded. And I now believe that this meeting of prominent officers engaged in the battle is and was intended to simply fix the positions of regiments and corps and has been arranged and carried out with that single view. And I am satisfied that it was not only my pleasure, but my duty to attend this meeting. He, of course, wrote that uh, after the fact. And, And many officers felt sort of this same way. They also think that someone like John Geary, the Pennsylvania governor, being there seems to indicate sort of a, uh, a political gain. He, he's sort of campaigning uh, essentially for uh, f- for his next election by attending this great reunion. Um, I'll go through just briefly here some of the individuals who did attend, uh, who might be famous names. I think Geary in that moment was probably the single most famous individual who was there. Today he is sort of taken a backseat in in fame, especially for those outside of Pennsylvania. Today the most famous person who was there I would say beyond the shadow of a doubt is Joshua Chamberlain, who was excited to be there. One of many times that he came to Gettysburg, uh, of course, by then had you know established himself as not only the former colonel of the 20th Maine, but uh, but is breveted as a brigadier uh, general in the aftermath of uh, his wound at uh, at Petersburg. Which actually, the day that I'm recording this is the anniversary of of that nearly fatal wound. Uh, of some of the other names who were there, John Newton, who commanded the 1st Corps after the first day of the battle, uh, former 6th Corps division commander, he is there. John Robinson, commanding the 2nd Division of the 1st Corps, is there. Solomon Meredith, famous commander of the Iron Brigade, is there. Roy Stone, commander of the famous Pennsylvania Bucktail Brigade, is there. Uh, a lot of... Uh, regimental commanders from the first corps there george standard famous uh, vermont commander uh, vermont brigade commander is there um going through the list here in the second corps we have alexander webb as i mentioned famous uh commander of the philadelphia brigade henry bingham uh who was the uh aide-de-camp to winfield scott hancock commander of the second corps he is there Looking at the third corps, we have Charles Graham, who eventually commands a he commanded a brigade, eventually takes command of a division about a year later in 1864. We have uh, 
Schweitzer, Brigade Commander of the 5th Corps, is there. Tilton, another Brigade Commander of the 5th Corps. William T- uh, Tilton, as we mentioned, uh, Joshua Chamberlain is there. We have in the 6th Corps, Albion Howe, who was a division commander, one of one of two division commanders at Gettysburg. Uh, we have Penrose Mark, for anybody familiar with Pennsylvania uh, history in the Civil War. He was the uh, regimental historian of the 93rd Pennsylvania. He, he goes on to write quite a bit of rather eminent pieces about that regiment in particular of the 6th Corps. In the 11th Corps, we have Adolf von Steinwehr, today namesake for Steinwehr Avenue in Gettysburg, famous uh, street along the southwest uh, section of town connecting to the Emmitsburg Road. He he was present. Um, George von Amsburg is there who eventually commands a division. Um, other officers from, from the 11th Corps there as well. And from the 12th Corps, Henry Slocum, uh, one of only two Corps commanders. I mentioned John Newton being the other. He was the 12th Corps commander is there. John Geary, as we've already talked about. Uh, George Sears Green, old Pap, Pap Green from Culp Seal fame. He is present as is his fellow brigade commander, Thomas Kane, uh, among others from that corps. Only five cavalry officers show up, including uh, David Gregg, division commander of the uh, of the cavalry corps. Major Robert Bell of the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, famous Bell's Cavalry, he is present. Henry Hunt, who commanded the, the artillery reserve for the Army of the Potomac, chief of artillery for, for the Army, is there. James Hall of Hall's Battery, 2nd uh, main fame is there. R. Bruce Ricketts, first com- or commander of the 1st Pennsylvania Light Artillery, is there. John Bigelow of 9th Massachusetts. Uh, in many respects, some of the biggest names were, were the artillerists who were there. Two signal officers, as I mentioned, and uh, five surgeons were present. Robert Lauren, probably the most famous of them. He was a surgeon who operated after the Battle of Gettysburg at Soldiers National, uh, I'm sorry, at, at the Lutheran Theological Seminary um, on the western side of town. Uh, speaking of the seminary, the last patient who left the Lutheran Seminary Hospital, George McFarland of the 151st Pennsylvania, he is there as well, one of many times that uh, he returned to the battlefield on one leg uh, as a result of an amputation he sustained in in the Lutheran Seminary. So that just kind of gives you a summation of some of the, the better known names that you might be familiar with uh, who were present at this 1869 Veterans Reunion. And these soldiers, as I said, will start coming on August 23rd. Now, of the Confederates who were there, we know of two for sure. John Allen, a veteran of the 7th Tennessee, and Walter Harrison, a veteran of the 46th Virginia. He was also the Inspector General of George Pickett's division uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg. There's a third man named John Phillips, who I've only found one reference to in the Philadelphia Inquirer on August, 23rd, uh, August 30th, I should say, 1869, so about a week after the reunion. Uh, and the Inquirer acknowledged that the other two men were there, uh, Allen and Harrison. Uh, but they say it has been mentioned that there were two, uh, but two Confederate officers present. There was another, however, who quietly stepped into Gettysburg on August 24th and registered his name at a hotel in town as, quote, General John Phillips, CSA. The paper continued, neither he nor Colonel Harrison was with any of the exploring parties. They don't really participate, in other words, in the reunion itself, in the positioning of these markers across the battlefield. Uh, But the Inquirer says that Phillips, quote, preferred to converse privately with a few friends and take a drive or two around the scene. And then Colonel Harrison apparently told the reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer that it, quote, graded rather harshly upon his feelings when a Union officer good humoredly slapped him on the shoulder with the exclamation, how are you, Johnny? Of course, a reference to that that phrase, that moniker, Johnny Reb. Uh, though, the paper said, he knew the salutation was not unkindly met. There, I no doubt, uh, I no doubt, have no doubt, whatever, that Lee and his fellow officers absented themselves from a feeling averse to viewing the scene of so heavy and decisive a defeat to their arms. So altogether, what this account is saying is that John Phillips and Walter Harrison don't participate in the reunion really itself. Uh, they just kind of hang out in the town of Gettysburg while the Union veterans are exploring the battlefield. And that it's no wonder that people like Robert E. Lee and other Confederates absented themselves, as the paper says, didn't bring themselves to Gettysburg so that they didn't have to endure or put up with uh, any sort of uh, subjugation or uh, co- comedic uh, value 
at the expense of, of union veterans. That's at least how these these veterans are interpreting it. And that raises the question, as we talked about in the interview the other day, what was the point of being there then? Why would you come if you weren't really going to participate? And I have basically two theories. Uh, one is that um, they simply didn't know until they got there how few Confederates would actually be present. And would that have changed their mind uh, if they... Um, you know, if they knew that there were going to be only a handful of them, would they have come at all? Uh, my second theory is maybe that they just came as this uh, mark of solidarity that, um, you know, I, I am a Confederate veteran. I don't in- intend to be part of your, um, you know, game, as, as some of them probably felt was happening by these Union veterans. Uh, but I want to show that, you know, we still exist. The Confederate veterans still exist. I, I can't get into the minds of these men. Of course, I don't exactly know. Um what their intent was in coming, but not really participating. But uh, but nevertheless, it is an interesting note. And Walter Harrison, as another side note, uh, had visited the battlefield on other occasions and was much more active, especially in working with John Batchelder, that first historian of the battle. Batchelder in 1894, now looking back on a few decades, had uh, written a letter to C.H. Bueller, who was the vice president by that time of the Battlefield Memorial Association. And he talks about how soon after the close of the war, he doesn't give an exact year, I met Colonel Harrison at Gettysburg and was with him at the battle, uh, or who was with General Pickett at the battle, excuse me. I invited Colonel Harrison to visit the battlefield with me, and we spent several hours under the shade cast by the Cops of Trees, this famous mark on the cemetery ridge line when he explained to me what an important feature that copse of trees was at the time of the battle and how it had been a landmark toward which longstreet's assault otherwise known today's pickett's charge or the, the pickett pettigrew trimble charge uh, had been directed impressed with its importance batchelder said i remarked why colonel as the battle of gettysburg was the crowning event of this campaign this copse of trees must have been the high water mark of the rebellion to which he ascended assented and from that time on i felt a reverence for those trees and then he talks about how basil biggs this free african-american man uh who owned by that point the property that included the angle and the copse during the battle that was owned by Peter Frey, a white man, but Basil Biggs had purchased it in the aftermath of the battle and was cutting down the copse of trees. It's his land after all. And Batchelder sort of has to plead with him uh, to recognize the significance of these trees. The reason I mention this story is that Walter Harrison, though he does not participate very heavily in the 1869 veterans reunion, was a key figure uh, to John Batchelder and to an interpretation of the battle because Harrison was purportedly present. If you were listening closely um, to the moment, it seems that Batchelder named the cops of trees and the high water mark of the rebellion. So those two famous terms that we continue to use today, whether correct or otherwise, and there are arguments on both sides of that. Um, he was there when John Batchelder coined these terms, not coined by veterans, it doesn't seem, but coined by this important uh, figure in the early history of this battle. Both of these men are there in 1869. Maybe that's when this uh, story took place. Like I said, he doesn't put a definitive year on it. Nevertheless, uh, an important anecdote, an important side story, um, I feel. Now, in terms of the coverage of of this event, um, the Star and Sentinel, Gettysburg's Republican paper, uh, talked about the movement to secure the attendance of prominent rebel officers, which proved, as we predicted it would, a most miserable failure. So they look at the fact that Confederate veterans are not there as a failure. The paper went on to say all the leading rebel officers declined to be present, either assigning other engagements or expressing themselves adversely to the movement. They talked about Lee and Fitzhugh Lee. And their replies, quote, undertaking to snub the Memorial Association by expressing the opinion that its objects are not in good taste and that instead of erecting memorials on the battlefield, it would be better to forget the past. The only effect of this attempt to mix oil and water, said the Sentinel, has probably been to limit the attendance of union officers. So here's another ulterior motive that they see in this reunion. These men disapproved a movement looking toward making Gettysburg a mere strategic blackboard upon which dry military demonstrations are to be chalked out instead of a perpetual memorial of the heroism of the Union Army, the loyalty of the American people, and the discomfiture of treason and rebellion. So the Sentinel thinks the only purpose of the reunion 
was to make Gettysburg a chalkboard, talk about tactics and what do tactics and the appreciation of heroism lead to, they say, but this idea of national reconciliation. And by national reconciliation, you are eliminating the importance of Gettysburg as a location at which to honor, as they say, the heroism of the Union Army, the loyalty of the American people, and the discomfiture of treason and rebellion. So another ulterior motive that in hindsight, even after the reunion was over, um, these men see. The Philadelphia Inquirer, along those lines, on August 24th, said that if the tendency of the proposed delineation of the lines of battle is of the character deprecated by the Lees, the whole movement should be speedily abandoned. So another negative impression of the purpose of this reunion. But this was evidently not the intention of those who originated the project, the Inquirer will say. And if it had been possible to attract a good representation of the leading combatants on both sides, the very opposite effect might have been produced by a striking demonstration of the readiness of the foes of 1863 to meet his friends in 1869. Walter Harrison, in his own right, this adjutant to Pickett's division, looking back on it years later, uh, said he availed himself of an opportunity to revisit the scene of the three days fighting at Gettysburg. And basically what he goes on to say is that when he receives this invitation, uh, he hoped that others might join him in coming to Gettysburg. But of course, that uh, that does not happen. And he said that no matter what the ulterior object of this association association or any other association connected with it, the object was sufficiently accomplished in fixing accurately the positions of the different commands of the federal army. So he acknowledges that it wasn't even really about interpreting the battlefield locations of the Confederate army. But he says that he was satisfied that they examined the field and had consultations of the officers present. Now, that's an interesting remark coming from a man who does not seem by press accounts to have actually participated uh, in the in the reunion events itself. He didn't tour the battlefield, as we said. But he was happy that the spirit of reconciliation evinced was commendable on the one side, the Union side, and I believe would have been responded to on the other. But he is disappointed that, quote, from what I saw, good might have, have been affected in a political point of view if there had been a number of prominent Confederate officers present at this meeting. He's disappointed that his former comrades chose not to to attend. Now, as far as what is actually happening on the battlefield itself, what was the purpose? Uh, we know what the purpose was. How did it actually look in terms of this reunion? Uh, a few days in advance, the New York Tribune said that visitors are constantly arriving. The citizens of Gettysburg are making a display of flags. There will be a military escort to the distinguished officers from the railroad station to their quarters. It is thought that the inspection of the various points of the battlefield will be commenced on Tuesday, which would have been the 24th, I believe, uh, August 24th. Uh, men start coming in by free rail travel over the Gettysburg Railroad, the Hanover Branch Railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Central Rail Railroad of New Jersey, and the Stonington Steamboat Lines, is the Gettysburg compiler, with a connection all the way to Boston. Free travel is expected over Western Railroads. Uh, and the just Springs Hotel will be general the general headquarters, it is understood, as we have already talked about. So men are coming in great numbers. Citizens are coming in great numbers to, to get a, a glimpse of what exactly uh, is happening on this battlefield. And they will be joined, says the Harrisburg Telegraph, by 15 or 20 reporters of leading daily and weekly newspapers on the ground. New York is represented by six or eight. Uh, it, is the, it is worthy of notice that the reporter representing the paper which most bitterly denounced the gathering drank the most whiskey. They don't exactly say who this is, but there's a reporter there apparently complaining about the, the event itself, and he's drinking the most whiskey. And then they say that the associated report press reports are as accurate and good, if not better, than those furnished by any other reporter on the ground. And that's a tradition that continues to this day. The associated press uh, has its roots, of course, in, in this period of history, and... Uh, will be there with objective journalism, not really editorializing as a lot of these other papers did. Starting on, on Tuesday, August 24th, men will tour the first day's battlefield. They will meet at the Lutheran Theological Seminary. Uh, they will go first to the site where John Reynolds was killed on McPherson Ridge. They find the tree marked with the letter R. Solomon Meredith, the one-time commander of the Iron Brigade, will express the opinion that Reynolds received his wound northeast of the point indicated 
And then uh, what you can see come out of these little debates that these men have where they say, I think this event happened there. And another person will say, no, I think it happened here is Lieutenant Thomas Turtle of the Engineer Corps. He was the, the battlefield surveyor and he personally superintended kind of drawing a map or, or driving the stakes into the ground to mark the position. So he would hear, it seems, arguments on each side and ultimately come to a consensus on where a stake would be driven into the ground as far as where it appeared events actually did take place. And the idea was that's where a marker or memorial would one day be placed. Uh, he used about 250 pine stakes, pine wood stakes, and he stuck them about three to five inches exposed above the ground. They only marked United States lines, only the federal line, the Union line. They didn't pay any attention, it doesn't seem, to what is today Confederate Avenue. Uh, the Buffalo Courier from New York noted an interesting event on August 27th. They said that while these men were touring the first day's field on August 24th, they were met by John Burns, famous civilian uh, hero of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they don't buy his story, though. Uh, they say that it was an incidental evil of the admirably conceived Gettysburg reunion, the threatened resuscitation of John Burns, the hero of Gettysburg. So they do not appreciate the fact that Burns decided to come out, whether they didn't buy his story, didn't like his personality. It's hard to say, but uh, but upset by the fact that Burns sort of crashes the party in their eyes. On Wednesday, August 25th, they moved from the first day's field now to the northern side of the second and third day's field. They toured Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and the surrounding areas, which would have included Wolf Hill as well. I didn't talk about it earlier, but the original positions on the battlefield that were preserved were the hills closer to town, which are today the least visited sites of the main battlefield. Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and even Wolf Hill, a modern site of what is today called the Lost Avenue. After these men visited those hills nearest to the town, the Gettysburg compiler said that there was a grand hop at the Springs Hotel. This is basically a large ball. And the compiler said, quote, The assemblage of fair women and brave men was the largest and most brilliant ever had in this region. And the music furnished by the Harrisburg Orchestra was just such as the occasion demanded, incomparable. Those fond of the mazy dance were on the top wave of enjoyment and kept it up until the small hours of morning suggested repose. Governor Geary, with a few others, left in a special train on Wednesday evening, so men are starting to pull out uh, that night. The Harrisburg Telegraph, though, doesn't think this is such a joyous occasion. They were sort of offended that there was a ball held on the first day's battlefield at the former site of the Harmon Farm along the banks of, uh, of Willoughby's Run. Uh, where f major fighting had happened on July 1st, 1863. So close now to, you know, a mile or a little more away from Soldiers National Cemetery, six years removed from the battle, the Harrisburg Telegraph thinks that uh, it's it's not a joyous occasion, that this is a, a great thing to do is have a reunion, but don't celebrate by having a ball. And the paper said this on August 30th, quote, the ball on Wednesday night has been denounced by several Democratic newspapers, but Democrats were instrumental in a measure in getting it up. So here they're bringing politics into the, the into the matter, of course, quote, although there was no charge for admittance and invitations were given to every guest of the hotel, the room is not crowded and all passed off pleasantly. So they think that the ball itself was uh, was good. Uh, they also will praise the fact that the of the, the contributions raised, the donations raised, $70 was given to soldiers' orphans at the National Asylum near the cemetery, a uh, famous site of uh, what used to be Soldiers National Museum right nearby uh, on Baltimore Street in town, the old soldiers' home where orphans of soldiers killed during the Civil War were able to, to stay. Uh, and then the Harrisburg Telegraph concluded this section by saying, quote, as to dancing over the graves of dead soldiers... They are buried a mile from the scene of the ball. However, the Democrats present appeared to stand it very well. None of them fainted, and three of them are still ready to sacrifice themselves upon the Democratic political altar. So seeing, again, these political ulterior motives in, in having a ball and festivities uh, at this reunion. On August 26th, the next day, a Thursday... Men toured the southern end of the battlefield at the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, Little Round Top, and Big Round Top. Uh, the compiler says yesterday was, uh, speaking the, the day after this, yesterday morning quite a number took their departure, and then a few more at noon. So they're talking about how dwindling numbers are touring the battlefield. 
all seem to experience great pleasure at meeting so many old friends and companions in arms and regret that their time together was necessarily short. And the next day, Friday, August 27th, the final formal day of the, the, the large-scale portion of the reunion, they tour the third day's battlefield, including Pickett's Charge, and it's very hard to find really any explanation of what these men discussed on the battlefield. And the same goes for the day before, at Peach Orchard, Wheatfield, Little Round Top, Big Round Top. And when we think about those sites today, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, Cemetery Ridge, The Angle, these are, of course, the most famous pieces of the Gettysburg Battlefield where the people who only have a couple of hours to tour, that's where they go. That's their understanding is Little Round Top and uh, Pickett's Charge. That's what the movie Gettysburg, of course, highlights. But this is the least highlighted aspect of this reunion, it seems. Partly that's because there are probably not great roads to get to them. The Park Service roads we have today, of course, are a long time to come. Um, but they don't seem to trek over the battlefield as much in those locations. This might have something to do as well with what was preserved not as much of those sections were preserved as were as we said cemetery hill culp's hill uh nor on the western side of town along chambersburg pike because those are the areas around the springs hotel and mcpherson ridge so there are certainly reasons to that but uh but all uh very interesting that the further south on the battlefield you go the more famous the sites today but the least discussed that they were in 1869 at this reunion and then the final day that there will be any veterans there is Saturday, August 28th, and this will be the day for the cavalrymen. As we mentioned, there only appear to be five cavalry veterans who were actually on the field, but the Harrisburg Telegraph says they visited what we know today as East Cavalry Field and South Cavalry Field. And there's an interesting little anecdote here. They said that one old farmer, and I assume this might have been at the Remmel Farm on East Cavalry Field, it's, it's hard to say, uh, but one old farmer whose land we visited and who has a fine barn still standing and well ventilated by round shot uh, bullet and shell holes, insisted upon showing them uh, the party having wonderful incidents to relate in connection with their effect as we went along. So they get this uh, farmer to introduce them to his property and show them some of the battle damage that still existed in his barn. And then the the uh, Harrisburg Telegraph says the operations of the Battlefield Memorial Association were concluded about 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon. Again, this is August 28th, 1869. And this was in time for all who desired to leave Gettysburg by the last afternoon train. And so this reunion is over. It will last from August 23rd uh, the, with the last men leaving on uh on August 28th. So five days altogether that there will be veterans there. For the most part, they were there for really only the first part of that week before they start to dwindle uh, for various reasons. Certainly personal um, uh, events happening elsewhere, lack of interest maybe in those later sections. Maybe men aren't getting quite as much out of this as they had hoped they they would. Uh, whatever those reasons might be, the early part is much more successful than the latter. The last thing that I want to mention is just what did people think about in the aftermath of this? And the best accounts that we have are, are the press accounts, those newspaper correspondents who were there as third parties. They are not, of course, participating in the uh, event itself, but having this um, hopefully objective view of things. And then they would go back to their hometown and, and editorialize with what they thought went well and what they thought did did not. And I'll just offer a few of these kind of as we uh, bring, bring this to a culmination. Uh, in Westminster, Maryland, just south of Gettysburg, on August 26, 1869, a paper known as the Democratic Advocate said, the reunion at Gettysburg proved a failure. In point of pomp and ceremony, the beautiful arch of evergreens and things under which the distinguished visitors were expected to march broke down and fell to pieces beforehand and the national flag was substituted. So they talk about it being a failure in part because the physical uh, props, I guess you could say the setting uh, that was supposed to be there, uh, it was a bad omen from the beginning. It started to fall down before these men even got there and they felt that the reunion just didn't accomplish very much. It wasn't very much worth it. Locally, the Gettysburg Compiler on August 27th said, The reunion of officers who participated in the Battle of Gettysburg has drawn to our town a large number of strangers, giving it an appearance of life and stir rarely to be witnessed. So it's an exciting time, says the Compiler. Many who were separated by the disbandment of the armies at the close of the war met here for the first time since. The greetings between them were 
were, of course, heartfelt and warm. Colonel Batchelder, who is an active and thorough worker, resolved the reunion should be a success. And so far as his share of the labor controlled, it is entirely so. So they think it's a good thing. It, it is a success. The many accomplishments that Batchelder has received, uh, um, compliments that Batchelder has received during the week, demonstrate a high appreciation of his energy and effectiveness, but no more than deserved. And they talk about how many men were there with their wives, and they see this as a family affair. They talk about the fact that there were bands, local bands, that offered great receptions, uh, that the citizens joined in the demonstration. And so all together, they feel as though this was a success. It brought together veterans, their families, and local Gettysburg residents. And overall, it seems to, to have gone off rather well. Gettysburg's other paper, the Star and Sentinel, a Republican paper, said the reunion of officers who participated in the Battle of Gettysburg has largely been a success. So even though they're politically uh, rival, the rivalry with the compiler, uh, they both seem to think that it was a success. Um, they say that uh, uh, they, they wish that more core commanders could have been present. They named Slocum. They don't mention uh, John Newton. I guess there's an asterisk because he didn't enter the Battle of Gettysburg as a corps commander, but two corps commanders were there. They felt that, that there should have been more, uh, but they said the field has been visited by officers who, who participated in the fight and the important points indicated throwing light on the movements of the two armies. They were excited by the reunion, the ball and the reception at the Springs Hotel, which, quote, passed off pleasantly. Um, then they say, as it is, the reunion of officers on the battlefield and a careful examination of the ground will largely aid the association in erecting the desired memorials of the struggle and for the information of visitors in all coming time. So they are excited that the takeaway from this reunion is that veterans toured the field and decided where markers would go so that subsequent non-military visitors, they're talking about people like us even up till today, could have an understanding of what happened there. It is worth noting, though, that in the grand scheme, the result of this reunion uh, did not come to to that. There were never, as best I can tell, markers that were erected as a result of this. The closest thing we get is in the 1890s and, and a few decades beyond that, when Gettysburg National Military Park begins uh, under the auspices initially of the U.S. War Department. They put up the, the brigade, the corps. Uh, the brigade division and corps markers that we see today. And then, of course, there were all these regimental monuments across the field. So while Gettysburg has a lot of memorials and markers today, 1,300 overall, as we said earlier, uh, nothing appears to have come directly as a result of this reunion of 1869. So in that regard, the long term, they could not have known it then. Um, it was somewhat unsuccessful in, in that regard. It is worth noting. A couple of other uh, contemporary reports. The Times Union from Brooklyn, New York on August 28, 1869. We believe that we are safe in saying that the people throughout the country are not only disgusted with the movement denominated the Gettysburg Reunion, but furthermore that they are decidedly of the opinion that it is a confounded humbug. So far as our reports of the proceedings thus far indulged in by those who might be better employed read, Nothing of any account has been done except putting up a few landmarks to show to posterity where their ancestors fought and where the blood of antig an antagonistic brothers commanded. Who started this idea, we do not know. They clearly didn't do a lot of homework. It was pretty easy to see who, who started it. Nevertheless, the, the Brooklyn paper continues, uh, Most certainly we do not care except that we hope none of the men who won the esteem and love of their country were implicated in organizing a movement at once peril, peril and worthless. We advise the monument makers to leave their occupation, go home, and do something that will be of service to themselves and their families, and to leave the honored dead in graveyard balls and dancing alone. So that is clearly you know, an, an antagonistic, as they say, uh, approach to it. They thought that there was really nothing to be gained. The final account that I have here is from the Harrisburg Telegraph, August 30th. I think it's a good place to, uh, to, to bring these accounts to a conclusion and the story of this reunion to a conclusion. The number of officers present from actual count reached nearly 150. The ex-rebel officers did not accompany, accompany the marking party over the Union lines, preferring not to appear conspicuous at any place. So they start out with basically saying the negative parts. 
There are 150 officers present. They don't seem to indicate that they think that's a great thing. It seems like they had hoped that there might be more, especially the fact that there were only a couple of Confederates and they didn't really participate in the events of the reunion itself. But the account will continue in fitting terms to conclude, I think, a a fair assessment of, of this reunion. This is, again, the Harrisburg Telegraph, August 30th, 1869. Quote, the facts learned during the week were of the most important character connected with the preservation of the site of the great battle which broke the backbone of the rebellion. Those who have pronounced it a failure, a fraud, or a fizzle either did not understand the object, were maliciously inclined, or else had taken too much from the glass house with a cork roof to see clearly. Basically, what this paper is saying is this is but one moment and a much longer movement to understand, contextualize, and interpret the battlefield at Gettysburg. And that is something that, of course, we continue to do today by visiting, by taking licensed battlefield guide tours, by going on park ranger battle walks, by visiting museums across the field and through the town, by listening to podcasts like this, and, of course, by reading books, using especially the words of the men who fought and fell upon the battlefield and who returned in subsequent years, including in the reunion of 1869, which we have discussed today. I thank you all very much for listening and appreciate the opportunity once again to return. I do I do want to give you a couple of, uh, of book recommendations, uh, three that are Gettysburg-specific, two that are bigger picture in terms of, of Civil War legacy and memory. Uh, I'll start with the bigger picture ones. One is very famous, David W. Blight's Race and Reunion, The Civil War and American Memory, looks at the first 50 years after the Civil War. He does have a brief section on Lee's response, especially to this 1869 Gettysburg reunion. But David Blight, Race and Reunion, a famous book for for good reason, sparked kind of modern memory studies, uh, the wave of them that we have seen over the past two decades or so. Another book I mentioned already earlier is M. Keith Harris, Across the Bloody Chasm, The Culture of Commemoration Among Civil War Veterans. In some respects, it's kind of an anti-Blight thesis. That's not to say uh, that, that you should read only one or the other. Both taken together are extremely important to understand uh, the thoughts in, in terms of modern understanding of veterans when they go to battlefields with their own uh, own side or, or, or with the men from the other side. Uh, read those two books back to back and, and you'll learn quite a bit about how we get through monument dedications and, and the era of, uh, of reunions upon the battlefield like the one we've talked about today. But also you can really see the origins for the debates that we continue to have uh, to this very day. A couple of other books, uh, Barbara L. Platt, This is Holy Ground, A History of the Gettysburg Battlefield. It spans from 1863 to 2006, so certainly uh, you know more work to be done um, even on the period since 2006, but that's a that's a great read for that first you know almost uh, 140 plus years of, of preservation at Gettysburg. Uh, along similar lines, you have Jim Weeks' Gettysburg Memory Market and an American Shrine. Once again, goes through that idea of battlefield tourism, monumentation, memory in general. Uh, one of my favorite books on the battle as a whole is Thomas A. Desjardins' uh, These Honored Dead, How the Story of Gettysburg Shaped American Memory. It's a series of essays ranging on a whole host of topics pertaining to how we get to Gettysburg and its memory today. Uh, there's there's one essay in there on John Batchelder, um, which, of course, ties in very closely with uh, with what we've talked about today. But any of those books I would highly recommend. There are many others as well, but those will be a good place to get you started. Uh, thank you once again to Matt and to Eric for setting this up, for giving me a platform and an opportunity to present this information. I look forward to uh, writing about this, presenting about this when we can get back to uh, uh, being safe and, and the ability to uh, attend lectures in person and, and talk with one another and engage in question and answer sessions uh, in person on battlefields at historical societies, at Civil War roundtables, at libraries, whatever it might be in the Gettysburg area and across the country. Uh, to connect with me, uh, feel free to visit my Facebook blog, Cody H. Writer and Historian. That's C-O-D-I-E-E-A-S-H is my name, Writer and Historian. 
You can also find a lot of my work on pencivilwar.com. That's P-E-N-N, civilwar.com. That's Pennsylvania in the Civil War, uh, which is a collaborative blog effort uh, with my colleagues and friends, Jake, uh, Rich, and Kendrick. And we talk about, as the name implies, the state of Pennsylvania's contributions to the Civil War era and the memory of it since. You can find us across multiple social media platforms. And then you can also find me on the Battles and Banter podcast uh, with my pals Avery and Tony. And we discuss all aspects of military history there, especially Civil War battle f- battles is, uh, by and large, uh, the bulk of what we cover. Some of my other personal uh, lectures are, are on that feed as well. So any of those platforms, uh, feel free to reach out to me, uh, codyashwrites.com or cody.ish at gmail.com if you want to send me a message. Uh, with a question about this lecture, a question about presenting at your institution, uh, whatever it might be. But thank you again very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you to Addressing Gettysburg Podcast. Stay safe, stay healthy. Till next time.